Today, we're going to go through uh, a whole chapter instead of just a few verses or just a few lines. And so pray for me because this is a lot of information. But the reason why I want to go through the whole chapter is not just to get it done. It's because I see how they're all connected. These stories that we're about to uh, read and witness and, and look at are connected. They're connected in such a way that they will connect to us. This morning, um, how many of you ever had a uh, check engine light? The, like one that would not go off, right? I knew one guy, he got so tired of seeing the check engine light, he just put black tape over it and just kept right on going. So today, um, I, you know, I call it sometimes, you know, we'll sit down with someone and say, hey, we're going to just stick a thermometer in you and see where you're at. Well, these stories or these, these real life stories that, that have happened in Jesus' life uh, might cause your check engine light to come on. And they might be, it might be for a reason that, you know, like you don't know why the check engine light comes on, it just comes on. Then you got to go pay someone with a tool to figure out the 1,000 things that it might be and how much thousands of dollars it's going to cost to get it to go out. And so today, though, really, I believe that the check engine light is going to come on for those of us that deal with pride. Oh, I see a bunch of red all over the place, but that's why I'm wearing it. And um, it, it is something that every human being contends with. No one is exempt from it. It is the reason why we have a devil. Um, pride is, is a hideous thing. And Jesus is going to leave sort of the 99 Israelites today and go after one. And uh, the one really is, is, uh, is a Gentile woman. And it's interesting to me that we learn what not to do in these passages of Scripture by some men, and we, we learn what to do by a woman today. And maybe that strikes a nerve in some men. But this is what happens, and this is what Jesus does. He, he not only establishes who he is, in, you know, who he is, his person or his power or his presence, which we talked about last week, but he's establishing the importance of, of focusing on him and him alone. And uh, it's not a prideful thing for him because he does it with compassion for his sheep. And so as we go through this passage, we're going to skip the last little part in uh, chapter 6 that we didn't go over last week, but I'm just going to give it to you in my own words. So in chapter 6, he ends up this, you know, this, this, this great feeding and whatnot, and they go on, they go on a boat and uh, they um, arrive at a marketplace, and a lot of the Jews, all of, this, all of his uh, work so far has been in Israel proper, right? Jewish communities, Jewish places. And so he's in this marketplace, and all these people are coming. And, and uh, he, he has so much ability to heal that they even touch basically his garments or get in his shadow, and people are healed. And they're coming from everywhere. And they're in the marketplace, which is a, you know, just out in the open where people are trading things. And so, so many people see him and so many people are flocking to him and he's healing everybody in that that comes in even close to him. And so now we pick up the story and suddenly he's going to leave Israel. He's going to go out of country, if you will. And uh, some people say it's because he was just overwhelmed. He needed rest. He took his disciples to a place where nobody perhaps would know him. But um, uh, word must have traveled fast because he went about 20 miles northeast to what we know today as Lebanon. But it is, it is not a friendly place. It is not a place that, uh, that, that Jews are welcomed. It's not a place of anyone even liking Jews. And so there actually it's a territory that had been established for, for centuries and they've been opposed to Jews. They do not like Jews, okay? And guess what? The Jews don't like them. And so there's this racial divide. There's this horrible racial divide between these two countries, between these two people groups. And here goes Jesus, leaves these 99, I believe, and then goes to this place called Tyre and Sidon. And from there he, he arose, excuse me, whoops. Now the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem. They saw that some of his disciples ate with hands and were defiled. I, I, I beg your pardon, so I got ahead of myself. 
because I can't wait hardly to get to this woman and her dilemma. But <laughs> we got to start at the beginning. But truly, this was after what happened in the marketplace with everyone being healed. So now the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem. So they were in this certain area, and these Pharisees and these scribes, these teachers of the, the law, these very influential people, these very in, influential Jews who understand the law, who understand uh, the commitment to, you know, to the Lord, to God, if you will, and they're coming there, and it looks, uh, when, when you read this, it's almost like they're, they're coming there to find out what's wrong with him. And it's interesting, um, people who, who are um, just littered, I guess, with, with this critical spirit, right? It's all a critical spirit in and of, in and of itself, or a critical attitude, or a critical preposition towards something, is generally speaking a way to elevate yourself above others. It's a way to establish yourself as more important than in someone else. And that's kind of what's happening here. And from, uh, so when the Pharisees gathered to him and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled. They were eating with their hands, that is, they were unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the marketplace, right? They came from the marketplace where they've been healing everyone. They do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. <laughs> I'd like to see how they wash a dining couch, but... So basically, I want you to pick up something here. This is not so that your hands won't be dirty and you'll get some kind of germ, you know, on your food. This was a tradition of the Jews that had been passed down to the point where it was, it was a way to make themselves holy. It was a way to make themselves presentable to God. And so they, it's sort of like us when we pray before we eat, and I, and I believe that we should pray before we eat and give God thanks. It's almost like in doing that, that makes us holy, really. It makes us like we, we feel connected to God in that place, right? Well, they had these great ceremonies of hand washings. I was reading about them. I'm going to bore with you all the details. But they had to have a certain amount of water. And then they were to hold their hands open like this and start from the wrists and pour the water over their wrists down to their hands. And they would take their fist and put it in the palm of the other hand and, and wash this hand with a closed hand while they were reciting certain things. And then they would do the same thing on this side and wash this hand. Then they would have to pour the exact same amount of water out. And they would have to do that before they ate over and over and over. Now the reason why they ended up with this tradition and it became this tradition became a law, right, is because the priests were asked to wash their feet and hands before they went into the temple. And so when we see this, these folks had, had ramped it up, had elevated it up, and made themselves a way to feel holy or to feel connected with God. And to believe it or not, we do that ourselves. It's, see, it's easy for a human being to make a list of certain things, and then you feel connected with God. If I just read the Bible, if I just pray, if I just do this, then I'm more connected with God. And what happens in that equation is you leave out Jesus. You leave out what you really need in order to be connected with God. And so Jesus is going to teach this right now. He's going to really hammer it hard. And so this is where our pride this morning could start to be elevated. Certainly, these, these Pharisees and these scribes that came are challenging him. They're criticizing him because your disciples are not doing it right. They're not washing their hands. And they even would go far enough to say, listen, if you don't present yourself wholly before the Lord and you eat, now you just participated with a harlot. That's what they would say. They would, it would, it would, they would defile themselves if they weren't doing it correctly, right? So, um, let's just keep going. So, and the Pharisees and scribe asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, <laughs> now th this is just like the kind of Jesus that we haven't really seen yet in Scripture. And uh, now he's going to be this, this, there's a side of him that, really wants to bring home the point. And sometimes we need to hear that kind of word from Jesus, like, hey, I'm really going to challenge you right, and I'm going to call you out for what you are, right? And so he says to them, 
He says, uh, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? Whoa, didn't Isaiah the prophet talk about you hypocrites? When, as it is written, the, these people, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Notice that he didn't even say elders. He said, teaching as, as, as though it would be a doctrine, the commandment of a man. You put this, this law on people, right? You put this, this, uh, th- this, this tenet or this, this place of, of, of worship on someone that was never required by God. I got a story, you know, I've said this story before. This is nothing against my grandmother because my grandmother was the matriarch of the family that brought a lot of people to the Lord. Uh, the first one that came to the Lord in her family was her husband at age 45 and so forth and so on. She's probably, uh, I am probably an answer to her prayer. Um, my grandmother was an amazing woman. But traditions have been passed on inside of that old church, that, that, that little community in Abbeville, South Carolina, to where uh, you couldn't do anything on Sunday. You know, everything was closed on Sunday. And uh, it's one of the reasons why Chick-fil-A is closed on Sunday. It came from the South. And I think it's a good thing because they're honoring God on that day. They're closing their place. They don't, they don't believe that they have to depend on seven days a week to have an income. So I'm not, I'm not saying that that's wrong. But here's how far it could go. My grandmother was taught that you cannot do any work on Sunday. And so um, we drove out there. This is about 25 years ago, 30 years ago or so. My wife had never met my grandmother. I wanted her to meet her. And so we went there, and we were in a little motor home. So we had a bunch of dirty clothes. So we got there on Saturday. And so on Sunday, um, my my wife went and started doing some laundry after church and my grandmother kind of gave her the stink eye like (laughs) well see this is what happens with legalism because it was one thing to wash the clothes inside where nobody could see but they didn't have a dryer it's a whole nother level of a devil to take the clothes outside and put them on the line (laughs) so my wife started walking out there to put the clothes on the line and and my grandmother was going to blow a head gasket I'm like And this is what happens when traditions of men are forced or or required. Do you think that God could was gonna was gonna change his attitude towards my grandmother if she put laundry on the line? Right? Well, this is what Jesus was trying to 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 say, hey, listen, you guys are honor me on on what you do, but and your heart is so far from me. And so we gotta be really careful. One of the takeaways here is that we gotta be really careful that. The things that we do on the outside cannot change what goes on on the inside. Marty did a great message a few weeks ago about the heart, and he took it from this passage where we're going next, right? So the first thing that he did was he kind of, he kind of, uh, in, in verse 8, he says, you leave the commandment of God and hold the tradition of men. So now he's going to show them their own sin. Right now he's going to go, okay, guys, you want to you throw that at me? then here's what I'm going to tell to you that's true. He said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making the void making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many other things you do. So what he's basically saying, what is Corbin? It's, it, it's basically, I didn't know what it was. I had to look it up. But I've been taught this before, that basically they had a loophole in the Jewish law that if you set aside uh, your property or you set aside some of your savings, you could actually dedicate it or vow it to the, to the temple or to God, right? And then you wouldn't have to take care of your parents who may run out of money or get sick. And it would be a vow. So it wasn't something that would actually go, okay, here's my property. It'll be the church's. It was like a commitment in your head. And Jesus is saying, you guys, you know, you, you left the commandment of God and you start up a tradition of man and you defile, you defile, you're the ones that are defiled, right? It's not, you know, it's, it's just horrible what religion can do. Now, there, be careful when you say, 
you know, it's a, it's a relationship, not religion. You got to be really careful with that because there are some traditions that, that, we, that we hold uh, near and dear to here at the church because they're in Scripture. They're, they're told, they're, they're given to us as instructions in, in how to live and, and, and things like baptism and, and uh, communion. Those are instructions. Those aren't traditions that the church has, has come up with. These are instructions from Jesus himself, right? So we can't throw out. I remember going to one church one time in the Bay Area, and uh, I was, we were with my, um, my wife's cousins, and they took us to church, and the pastor got up there. He said, today we're going to break tradition. I'm like, okay, what's he going to do? And he actually served potato chips and Coke instead of juice and bread. And I'm like, hmm, that might have stretched, uh, not just me, that might stretch the Lord a little bit right there. I guess if that's all you had, right, it's, it, it's the matter of the heart. But he was trying to, to bring forth a point. Today I almost was going to start with communion, go into preaching and end with worship, and then just to, just to kind of change it all up, right? But there's no point in that because Jesus is trying to bring the point here in his word this morning. So he's basically saying, listen, your traditions have, 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 have blinded you against the truth that your problem is a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of what you do, all right? And so he's going to now leave there. Um, oh, so have, let's keep going. He said, you know, find a way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. And so he, he um, uh, basically presented the case to them, and then he called all the people that were around there to himself, and he begins to teach more. This is the first time we see Jesus in the, in the book of Mark teaching so much, which is really good. And he called the people to him again, and he said, hear me, all of you, not just the scribes, notice, not just the Pharisees, right? But all of you, he said, including his apostles, hear me. And understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had said, when he, when he had entered the house and left the people, now he left them, he left everybody, he's in the house with his disciples, and then his disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, uh, then are you also without understanding? One, one passage, one translation says, are you still dull? <laughs> so Jesus is on a roll. He's, he's called a hypocrite a hypocrite. He's calling his own dull, right? Are you still understand? What's the matter with you, right? Wait till you hear what he says to the woman, all right? So uh, do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, guilty. Every single account. Because Jesus says if you so much, you just, you just don't dislike someone or, or you don't forgive them, it's, it's just like murder. He even says if you look upon a woman even so much with lust in your eyes, you've committed adultery in your heart. Guilty. So he's telling everybody, there's stuff that comes out of us that defiles us. It's not what we put, do on the outside. It's not how much we wash our hands that makes us Holy. Or how much church attendance we have that makes us holy. Or keeping the clothes off the line doesn't make us holy. Or doing this, 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 this doesn't get access to God. And because they're hypocrites in the church, there are many people that won't come to church because of hypocrites. But the church could, could, could there's room for another one. I heard this the other day that, you know, the, the hypocrite that's in the church is a little bit closer to God than the hypocrite on the outside. They're a little bit closer. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> I was guilty of that. I wasn't about to go to church. I remember you guys that uh, back in the day in the early, uh, 
80s when my wife would go to church and I never would. I had every reason known to man. Some of them were actually good reasons because they had these legalistic ideas in this church. Um, back in the day, it, they weren't the Lone Ranger in these, 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 uh, this legalism that basically you couldn't uh, watch the Smurfs on TV. Uh, you, you know, there was so many Ninja Turtles off limits. Um, and, and on and on it went. And the preaching became all of those, those issues. And where did Jesus go? It's like, you know, where's Waldo? Where did Jesus go? And then it got even ramped up. When I told my wife, I said, you may want to go find another church. Is they wouldn't let people use Procter and, and Gamble soap. Because they had a symbol on the, on the thing that might have been satanic. Anybody remember those days? Well, I was still at home. I wasn't about to go to y'all's church. I already knew I was jacked up. I didn't have to have a ninja turtle to jack me up. That's what Jesus is trying to say. It doesn't matter what you exclude from the outside. It's what you are on the inside. We're all a train wreck. We're all jacked up. And for us to look at someone else like you're unholy because you're not washing your hands, they're more jacked up than the jacked up. So here we go. So um, he declares that. He says all these things come from within and they defile. That's what defiles me. Even what I think. Much less what I do, right? So, so listen, we're all guilty before God. We all fall short of the glory of God. That's the first part of the gospel. And so Jesus, you know, he, he's teaching. He, he's moving through this, this, this land, and, and, he's, and he's teaching his own people. And all of a sudden, he goes to Tyre and Sidon. That's where I started. I wanted to get to here so fast, so I, I kind of went ahead. So it's like we're going backwards in the movie. So now... From there he arose and he went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know. I don't know if the house was vacant. <laughs> you know, I don't know. But, but he didn't want anyone to know he was there. So obviously he was, I don't know, he was, he was leaving this area of Israel, going to a place that was defiled, really defiled. And he could not be hidden but immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. You know, when Renee said, uh, how many of you have little daughters? I felt cheated. I'm like, oh, I don't have one. I wish I did. You know, this woman did. Shallow old girl. And she was messed up. You know, if you ever want to know what an intercessor does... It's step in the place of someone else and they pray. Certain people are really good at intercessory prayer, but every parent becomes an intercessor when their child is sick. You can imagine having the demon. And so she finds out that Jesus is there. There's this religious man and he's come to our town and he's in that house hanging out and, and my daughter, she's a mess. And, and so I'm going to go in there and I'm going to plead with him. And she is very defiled. She's very unclean. She's a Gentile. Otherwise known as a dog. You think of whatever word that maybe a tradition has been passed down on you about another race. Think about it. I heard so many different names of different colors of people that I had to un unravel them out of my head. And Jesus is going to use one. And it's just crazy how she receives it. Immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard him and came and fell down at his feet. Just saying, you know, isn't it interesting that the guy that was demon-possessed fell at his feet? The woman with an issue of blood fell at his feet. The woman, that, the, the man who, whose son was just, about, you know, daughter was about to die fell at his feet. She falls at his feet. Now, the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. In other words, she was a Greek, she was a Gentile, she was not a Jew. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. 
Man, I, can, I know what that looks like. I don't know about a demon, but sickness is. I just begged Jesus to just remove this. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Wait a minute. I, where's my loving Savior? Where's my compassionate friend? Where's the mercy there? But see, the teaching here is not what Jesus said. It's how she responded. How would you respond? Now, we do just some background here is that Jesus was the Messiah who came first for the Jew and then the Gentile. And it's almost like a little, a little shadow, a little hidden type in the middle of his story where he goes and he leaves the 99 and he heads to this Gentile community and he introduces himself to this woman. But it not, oh, I left the 99 and I came to you. No, I can't give you any bread because you're not one of mine. You're not one of the children. In fact, you're a dog. Now, I told you, you're red, you're, you're red engine light. Your, your, your engine light might just come off now, especially if you're a woman. But see, this woman's plight She's still at the feet of Jesus. And she says this, says this. She was very, very wise and very, very not full of pride. And she said, let the children be fed first. He said, let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread, throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said, yes, Lord. What? Yes, Lord. Not only, yes, you're right, but you're Lord. You're right. Did she know the messianic, well, messianic, <laughs> the, the messianic prophecy? I don't know. That he would first come to the Jew and then the Gentile? Did she know what was going to happen next? I don't know. But she said, yes, Lord. But yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Even the dogs, even the dogs that you just called out, you know, they, 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 they run around the outside of the table and are waiting for the children's bread to just become a crumb and they eat that. Can you just give me that? Yes, I will take that place. I will take that place of a four-legged creature just to get a crumb. If that's what it takes to understand who you are and what you have for me. Yeah, I'm not worried about you with unclean hands or washing pots or the table. I'm not even worried about what you just called me. I just need you. I need you to help me. Help my daughter. For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. For this statement, for this act of humility or not being offended by your Savior, not taking up an offense, but just say, you know, like, just give me a little bit. Then, then, then if I'm a dog, then they get to eat, then just feed me. Now remember, this comes on the heels of feeding 5,000 Jews on the side of a hill and having leftovers. And all she cares about is one little piece of bread. That woman has no red light on her dashboard. How did that happen? And then she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Imagine that woman. Oh my gosh. Imagine now. Remember the woman at the well? This man that knew everything about me yet he received me this man that knew that I didn't deserve him found me worthy of saving me and my daughter then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through sight on another area of Gentile community he left there and then he went to this other place and 
to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis, and they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. All the community. This reminds me so much of the the, the men that brought the paralytic. They all brought this person. They must have really loved this person. They say, help him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately. Notice Jesus is not looking for an audience. Many times when he heals, he, he removes himself and the person into a private place, making it personal. Maybe in part because he's already got this huge people following him, wanting healing. They begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, you guys, listen to this. This is not COVID friendly. (laughs) He put his fingers into his ears. And after spitting, he touched his tongue. Oh, wait a minute. You got to wash your hands. Now remember, the guy can't talk, he can't, he can't hear, so he puts his fingers in his ears and, and he spits on his hand and puts it on his tongue. Um, but wait a minute. Did you wash your hands first? And he sighed. Oh my gosh, you know what? I feel like he's sighing for all of us. Oh, sometimes the spirit without words groans, just groans. And he was groaning with words that cannot be articulated, but it's understood in heaven. Oh, just can you just take that one word that he sighed? It's not like, okay. Uh, let me get my stethoscope here. Let me get my tongue depressor here. Let me just look in your ear here. Let me look in this ear here. Yeah, I think, you know, da 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 uh, Yeah, just, you know, you know you're stuck. <sighs> Can you imagine having a doctor when you go in there sick and he would sigh? This is truly the great physician. <sighs> and he uses some Aramaic here which I don't really know how to pronounce. But he looked up to heaven and he sighed and he said, Ephaphatha, which means be opened. This morning, I want to hear that. Be open. Can you see what I'm doing? You have eyes, but you can't see. You have ears, but you can't hear. Be open. And his ears were open, and his tongue was released. And Josh, you called it out this morning, the fields white unto harvest. If you're hearing the good news of the gospel, then your tongue should be released to go and proclaim it. But here's what happens. He tells the, the, this person that just opened his ears and his tongue to loose, don't tell nobody. And partly because the reason... That, that, that I believe, it, and, and most others believe, that partly the reason is because everyone just keeps coming for healing, but he wants them to wait until after the resurrection to go proclaim who he is. Because he wants to take away sin. But he's trying to, he's not trying, he's successfully showing himself as who he is. And then after the resurrection, he says, the field is white unto harvest and go and tell the whole world about me. But this this young man, I I would have, anybody else would have just said, oh yeah, I got my tongue, I got my ears, and and it was all about me. No, you're going to proclaim that it was Jesus. Jesus charged them to tell no one, all of them, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. I wish we would get that zeal today. I wish we would zealously proclaim it. We've been set free to do it. This guy did it and was told not to. And then he said this just beautiful picture here. He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. A lot of us are going to go home. 
We're going to prepare some kind of a dish, side dish, go to someone's house and watch the Super Bowl. Some of you won't. I don't want anyone to feel guilty. Otherwise, I'd be heaping the tradition of man on you. Oh, this church is not allowed to go watch Super Bowl. But what has the Holy Spirit revealed to you? Are you still working out of some self-righteous manner? Are you still taking the offenses that come and, and, and saying, woe is me, and blame shifting them? It's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. You're still not open to be teach, to taught, or, you know, it, it, Dwight Moody said this. He goes, the, man that, that Je- the people that Jesus will turn away are the ones that are already full. Never will he turn away someone that's empty. And sometimes those of us that are too full need to be emptied again and fall at his feet. Jesus, call me a worm. Call me a dog. Call me not worthy because I'm not. And yet, And yet, you died for me. And somehow or another, you're opening up my deaf ears and my blind eyes. Now loosen my tongue. Now let me get up and praise the Lord. It says in Scripture that if we're not willing to take care of our own, being our mother and father, then basically then we are worthless. So Jesus still commands us to honor our mother and our father. He's still looking for those true disciples, those true followers. But he knows this, church, that we all fall short of the glory of God. And yet he just keeps picking you back up. But listen, be careful that you don't stiff arm him with your pride or stiff arm someone else with your tradition. I'm going to end with this story. I've told this story before, but I feel like it's so pertinent because it really, it it blew my mind, not only uh, the other gentlemen. Both of our minds needed to be blown, but I was always taught in ministry, if someone wants one, give them two. Because the Father gave it to you. He'll, he's the one that supplies all your needs. Don't be stingy with what you have. If someone wants something, give it to them. And if they want one, give them two. So at the warehouse at Craftsman for Christ, we literally had, if those of you that remember back in the day, I know some of you here will remember this, is that we would have uh, three semi-loads of food come in in a week. And none of us were there to work. And so at that time, we were still a bunch of part time, not part time, but all volunteers. And so I would run back to the uh, warehouse and the truck would pull in and I'd, I'd grab anybody that wanted to help me unload it. And we'd unload the pallets and then we'd call volunteers to separate everything and to give it back out. Well, one afternoon, me and this guy, his name is John, and, and I, he's given me permission to tell the story because he tells the story to everyone. But John was a, a manager of a Lucky's back when they had Lucky stores here. Uh, grocery store, for anyone that doesn't know what that is. It's not a, it's not a casino. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but man, uh, you know, John, he, he was very efficient. He was a man of structure. He was a man of discipline. He was a man that, that you know, that, that you got to work for what you eat. He, he was just a man, you know, and he, he just, he was, he was pretty full of himself and about the way he made himself. And and uh, so anyway, he was the guy that met me. He was retired now, and he met me down there to unload this truck. And we, we just unloaded 44 uh, uh, pallets of diapers. And uh, we had already loaded, unloaded that morning. I think my father and someone else unloaded a whole bunch of food. And here comes this brand new extra cab back in the day. This extra cab thing had just come out. It was brand new, didn't have license plate on it yet. And this, this two Hispanic ladies get out of this brand new truck as we were locking up the doors. 
and they're locked, literally locking the door because we didn't have time to unpalletize everything. And they walk up and she says, pamper comida. I want diapers and food. And you know what my brother said? We don't have any. You know why he said that? Because they drove a brand new truck. I said, uh, I'm going to cover my brother here. I said, I'm, I'm going to cover him. But I'm going to say, you know what? Uh, can you give me your address? I know this was the Lord. Just like I know it was the Lord that, that sent his son to Tyre and Sidon. He set that whole thing up. I said, let me have your address because tomorrow he is going to deliver you some pampers and some uh, food. And you look at me. So they wrote their address. Now, we were on Garden Highway, and their address was on Garden Highway, but it was a strange address because it said something, 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 uh, Unit C. And so, um, and the address was north, or excuse me, south, all the way to the end. You can't drive down there anymore. You can drive down there, but Garden Highway used to t turn into uh, 99, doesn't anymore, but back then it did. And so I just, I'm going to go with them. The next day, we loaded up uh, some diapers, and uh, I asked her for her size, and she gave it to us, and some, a, a, a banana box full of food. So we drive and drive and drive. We get down to the end of Garden Highway, and there's this great big farmhouse with this beautiful truck. It was blue, same truck. He goes, see? I go, yeah, I see. But that's not their address. And we went down this little dirt road, and it was this little shack after shack after shack that where basically migrant workers lived. And I knocked on the, he knocked on the door, and he, and he noticed there was one of the ladies there. And she said, come in. He didn't want to step in. I said, go in there. And you guys, inside this place was a little uh, uh, electric, uh, what do you call, like a little burner thing like a, let, a little hot a hot plate with an empty can of beans on it I said what's your name I don't remember her name and I just see John he just starts breaking and this little girl walked out I kid you not she had a paper towel on for a diaper and he just broke and I broke with him and so John dear brother John he goes, we'll be back. He felt the whole back end of his pickup full. <laughs> you, couldn't even fit every, you couldn't even fit everything into that woman's house, you know? You couldn't even fit it there. So what's the, what's the connection? It's not what's on the outside. It's what goes on on the inside, both that will defile you, but also that will make you look like his son and daughter. And sometimes all you need is a crumb. Sometimes all you need is a crumb. Let's pray. Jesus, we come before your communion table this morning, Lord. Help us to see how valuable this little piece of bread is in this little cup. Help us to understand that you didn't have to save us, but you saved us. Help us to understand, Lord, that there's no dividing wall, Scripture says, between Scythian or slave or free or man or woman or Gentile or Jew, that you have broken down all of those barriers. Now, continue this morning, Lord, to break down our pride break down unnecessary traditions, break down dividing walls, humble us to the point of being on our knees at your feet if that's what's required. Keep us from picking up offenses. Help us to entrust our soul to the one who judges justly. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for your word because it's powerful, it's full of truth. It's the water for our souls. It's what puts life onto dry bones. So continue, Lord Jesus, to feed us, even if it's a crumb. 
continue to open up our eyes and our ears and loose our tongue. Shrink our pride, increase our humility, and help us to praise the Lord. Help us to love one another. Help us to give to the needs of others. Help us to see the greatest need is our own. And the greatest solution is Jesus. Speak to us this morning. Bless you. Amen. I remember my grandmother, in spite of her tradition, she had a deep love for Jesus. And sometimes those traditions are not just because a man told you, but they really believe that this is a way to honor God. And so if you have one of those traditions, just know this. It's okay that if you've developed something like that for yourself, but just don't demand it on to others. If you pray before you eat, don't get mad at someone that doesn't pray before they eat. You just continue to pray before you eat. That's never. <laughs> That's a good thing. We're going to sing this song to close after we take communion. It's a powerful song. It's filled with the gospel, filled with the good news. You know, one of the things that has become a tradition here at the Bride Church is that we do communion every Sunday. Now, if we didn't, if we didn't for some reason, God's not going to change the way he looks at us or what he sees inside of us. He's not, it's not going to change anything. The reason why we do communion every week, it's greater than a tradition. It's because if the pastor forgets why we're here, he will be reminded when he grabs this, or whoever's speaking. Because as often as we do this, Scripture says, Jesus said, we do this in remembrance of him. Now, obviously, we just preached a whole bunch of information that came from Jesus. But the reason, again, why he wasn't so quick to tell him to go tell everybody about him, because the work wasn't finished. But this declares that the work is finished that his body was broken for us. His body was placed on the cross in place of us. His body was broken and striped and wounded and pierced, and we should have been. And his blood was spilt. But his blood was, none like, it was human, but it was none like any others because it had never experienced sin. He didn't sin when he called that woman that because he knew it was on the other side of that commission. He died for that woman. He died for you, he took your place. And he says, I will remember your sins no more. Anybody need to hear that this morning? I will remember your sins no more. Your sins were like just crimson, but now they're white as scarlet. There's nothing on the planet that can go on the inside and declare your sins, your defilement clean, but Jesus. And he declares that this morning to anyone that needed to hear it again. And then he rose. 
justifying himself first as God, and then by faith we are justified and given the righteousness of Christ. That defiled old man now walks around in right standing with God. Now we're called to walk this thing out, Lord. Help us this morning to go and tell, for the spirit to just increase inside of us, Lord, that we would decrease and you would increase, and that others would see that there's something unique about that woman. There's something unique about that man. He's not offended. He's content. She's content. Because they have peace with God. Let's eat and drink together.